Thank you, Patrick. Thank you for having me, Bossy. So who came for the revolution? Who came for the word web? Just as a show. Well, the, the fists, up is, okay, so I'm not really sure which it is, but uh, when you want people to show up to your talk, you have a provocative title. Provocative slides are also important. So villains, obviously. Um, throughout this, I will be pointing to hax.psu.edu. If you want to go there, browse around. If you have a computer, you want to run our NPX commands and get this infrastructure to run locally to start building websites, because this is a platform for building websites. I want to say that up front, because sometimes I rant a little long, and the Joker's in things, and I have the character hat, because occasionally I drop into that character. But so... Who am I? Because uh, I'm new to this community. Uh, my name's BTO Pro. I also in IRL go by Brian Olendike. And I've been a web developer at Penn State for over 18 years, working in the same office, which is a little odd probably, um, but it's on purpose. I have an awesome arrangement since 2008 where I can con contribute 100% of my work efforts as open source. We got this very early on. Um, under the guise of everything I work on going towards higher education and putting on online courses. So the web is for online courses. Web technologies are for online courses. Everything you see today is for online courses and can only be used that way, right? Good. <laughs> we agree. So I have many hats in this job. Occasionally I'm BTO pro with the professional hat and occasionally in the past I've been a gray hat. Uh, which I go by the moniker EdTech Joker. Uh, this would represent my classroom teaching. But no matter what I do, it's open source all the way. And trying to synergize the work I do on my project with the work I do in my life, with my personal blogging, with what I'm talking about externally, with the friend groups that I associate with, any of that, it must be in pursuit of hacks and the web revolution. So for 18 years, I've been a full stack developer unicorn. Now, at you, this is usually where people laugh spontaneously and none of you did, um, but I see that the unicorn phrase is being thrown around a lot. Um, anyone know what video game this is? This is a, no? All right, it's between Jenner and Mason. You're supposed to know what this video game is. All right, never mind. Uh, you can do backflips on the horse. I forget what the game is. So um, for 10 years, I worked in Drupal largely backend focus, module development. I have, I think, 120 plus Drupal contrib modules, really easy when you get in before they make you sign off on the contributor covenant and go through code reviews if you're just able to uh, blanket publish things. But then nine years ago, I switched my entire career around at the drop of a hat because of a singular technology, which I'll be talking about today. I'm also an educator. I teach front end web development in the university. And so I teach students at Penn State how to do web component based development and contribute to an open source project. Uh, and to that end, I am also an activist. I code for a social cause. This is not just software, it influences the world we live in. And we have to think about these platforms this way. I am very, very critical of the work I used to do in the Drupal land because of who it was empowering at the beginning and at, towards the midpoint of its life cycle. And so I had to jump, jump to a different ecosystem. Because my social cause is to reduce the cost of web publishing to zero. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you know what the internet is. You have to be a part of it. And if we don't make it accessible to people to the highest degree, if my son can't go and just paste something and be building websites, we have failed. And by we have failed, I mean people are going proprietary. People are going to a vendor land option because the UX is what people are attributing to. And then the ideals kind of fall behind the UX. Me personally as well, been posting on Twitter all day trying to say, hey, I'm doing this, why? Because it was easy to get the app, it was easy to connect to, and there's, there's people there. So I am the Hacks Project Lead, if you've seen this logo coming around. Um, and so this is the part where you say, <laughs> what is Hacks? So we are seeking ubiquitous web authoring and publishing. So this is to enable creativity to flow like water. I don't care what your ability is, you should be able to make funny memes on the internet. You shouldn't have to think about that. You should be able to write paragraphs. You should be able to build tables. You should be able to put 3D animations online. It should not get stuck in, yes, but how do we get thing from point A to point B? So to me, ubiquitous web authoring means that it's simple. It's 99% invisible. 
It's sovereign, static. I should be able to give it to you as a zip folder and everything should be there so that you can take it and do what you want. It should be cross-platform. That's both on the browser side, but also on the server deployment side if there's anything they're powering it. Highly accessible. Everything must be accessible and that also comes into performance and speed as an accessibility consideration. If I can't get things from here to the other side of the earth and it load effectively or it's using a lot of energy, it's not accessible. It has to be standards based so that we can live as long as possible and it must be extensible. And if we want people to help build and develop it, it has to be developer friendly. But note that that's the last bullet point. Right? We, our user community is largely people that don't care about the web. They just want to go click edit and write some stuff, but they need to present themselves online and the web technologies get in the way of them doing that. So where are we right now? Uh, using other analogies, right? What is a telephone back in the day? What is the internet? Well, in 2015, the idea of hacks was born. Could we allow people to edit pieces of HTML and just visually drag and drop them around. Around 2015, this is where Gutenberg Editor is there, is kind of a response to the Wix Squarespace ecosystems that are starting to really take hold. Then in 2018, we get into standards phase. We found a paradigm where things could potentially work. They looked awful, and so you need lots of memes when things look awful so that they're at least funny when your demo looks terrible. Um, but largely built on top of JSON schema, came up with an abstraction of that that we call hack schema, which I'll get into a bit down the road. Then we get into the UX refinement phase. Uh, so hacks went from an idea in 2015, some standards and some demos that were hilarious but awful looking in 2018, to 2022, we've done multiple rounds of UX audits, some involving um, the National Archives in the past, some involving different colleges at Penn State. But we've been able to build a web authoring interface that feels like something for editing a web page. Right now, it's used to power several hundred courses at Penn State between three different colleges. It's worked on by students in those colleges. And so this is sort of getting into the, hey, we've, we've all got these flip phones. They generally have the same form factor. They generally work the same way. And where we're trying to get to, and I think we're approaching, is ubiquity phase. Right? So for the phone, this is the iPhone launching. The phone is no longer just for talking. It is a platform. And so the web has also come a long way since those initial days where you're transmitting data from point A to point B. It is a platform. We all build things that have to go out and be marketed on top of it if they are to exist. Social media is entirely built on top of this. So in our world, web authoring for anyone. And shown is three different themes in this case, which are all powered by the Hacks ecosystem. So what is Hacks? Hacks is web components. Has anyone heard of web components? No, I don't just mean components. And I don't mean React components. Please stop using React components. Please don't work in React. I need to just say that out loud in any talk. Um, it's hundreds of new HTML tags. And so 515 of them to be exact. This has been worked on largely underground since 2015. It needs to be an awesome experience. I have about four seconds of your time when I initially hit edit. And if it looks terrible, you won't care about the infrastructure underneath. And so we have hundreds of tags to power our interface, all of them open source, hundreds of which work anyway, as I'll demo a couple, right? So this could be very practical things, things like an icon. And so if we start at an icon, if we had an HTML tag that delivers iconography, we don't argue about should it be SVG based, should it be CSS font based, and switch between those two approaches based on whatever muddled ecosystem we're getting into, because that seems to shift every three or four years. So in our ecosystem, we have a tag called simple icon. Then whenever we use simple icon and we reference the JavaScript for that icon, that unfurls and hey, we have this experience. This can be for silly things. So I had my students as a design project make the silly character that I, if you've seen any stickers, and it's a literal tag in the system. It's called RPG hyphen character. We can treat HTML as an API in this way. So if you see, we have different characters reading off of a seed value. So we've added a custom HTML attribute. When we change that, 
We have internal logic via JavaScript that then says, hey, that RPG character should look like this or be set on fire or walk around with a cup of coffee or be the one on my shirt, which if you type in BTO Pro, you'll generate every time. But we get to more practical things like video players. People don't want to think about how do I embed Vimeo versus YouTube versus this custom MP4, right? It should just be I'm putting a video on the page and it's there. And in order to do that, we need a tag that helps encompass those APIs and bridge them all together. So for us, that's video player. Note, these icons are simple icon buttons which have icons wrapped inside of them. So we're able to keep stacking tags in other tags. We're creating a giant Lego-like ecosystem. And if we keep building up from a singular icon, which is where we started, you can replace your entire job, which is what I did after about two years of doing this. Building on standards, I no longer had to fight with Drupal's template engine to just try and modify some uh, tiddlywink CSS and HTML structure on the output. And because of that, because I had the transparency of working on just one thing, seeing the output, and via the web component standard, knowing it will look the same in every browser regardless, that liberated me to keep building up. And so we have an H-A-X tag. It is a full web editor. Think of it as trying to compete in the uh, CK editor, tiny MCE sort of sphere, right? You could put this into other ecosystems, edit your HTML blob. But why would you stop there? You can build a content management system because once I have an editor and I have blocks and I can edit those blocks and I hit save and put it somewhere, wrap some additional state management of multiple pages, have a theme engine, and we have a full content management system. Oh, goodness. So tax is magic. There's a, a script here that thankfully pointed to, so I didn't, I was going to have this slide in here, but hacks is magic. And by that, I mean, we have this script that we call the magic script that helps with hydrating our ecosystem anywhere. And so effectively the way it works is it's a mutation observer looking for things that are not defined. And anytime it finds something that's not defined, it takes that tag, matches it to a registry and dynamically imports the definition. And so we can basically blow up all traditional build and bundling routines that we've had previously. Hacks is a course. I have wrapped my entire 256 course around the Hacks ecosystem. Students learn modern front-end web development. They go from not having web experience previously, most of them, uh, maybe two courses. This is probably their third programming course. So they go from that level to their introduction to the web is we're going HTML, CSS, and when it gets to JavaScript, we're learning web components and web tooling. And oh, by the way, it happens to be so that we can solve issues in an open source project. So I get 50 to 60 students per semester contributing in this way. And it's not to suggest 50 people are of equal skill immediately out of the gate, but consistently we get large scale issues ticked off out of our queue every semester from this approach. So we have a sustainable pipeline, which is giving students industry grade skills. Web components are, at the last I checked, showing up on 20 plus percent of, of all web traffic. They're in YouTube, they're in the Firefox browser, they're by, used by EA Games, they are all over the place. Pax is also a community and we've had uh, events in the past that were smaller scale that we're trying to reboot now. So inevitably, Hacks is an ecosystem to empower anyone to publish on the web without understanding the web. Because the web is super confusing and it should just work for everyone. I love all the different projects that are mentioned here, but if it can't be explained in such a way as a person goes and like clicks a button or double clicks in an app store, um, most people aren't going to be able to use it or contribute to it. And I want people to be able to contribute to it regardless of ability. So who we empower to contribute matters. If we're taking just a few examples out of that, that mush, 11 is awesome. If you need to do static site generation, I highly recommend looking into 11 You write a bunch of markdown files, you put them in a certain structure. It's got a whole ecosystem. All the words I just said have cut out 99.9% .9 of the human population from using that technology. It's not a knock on it. It's awesome for us. So we go up a level, right? We have the Drupals, the WordPresses, uh, Grav CMS, things like that. This is for technically minded site builders. You can get some content authors in there for sure but they need to be on the advanced side. 
And at one time, I wouldn't have put WordPress on here. And that was before I started teaching. Because I said, oh, my default is, well, just if you need to throw up a site, just throw up on WordPress. That's easy. And yet consistently, the students I would run into who are digital native, as is a term thrown around in education, as a flawed term, had no idea how to interface with WordPress. It's not that easy to put a, web, a website online. There's lots of tools to simplify the process for sure, but it's still not that easy. And when it's not that easy, we drop below the red line. I'm going to Medium, I'm going to Substack, I'm going to Wix or Squarespace, I'm going to social media because I didn't have to think and I just hit the button and I'm online and there's a URL and I send it to you and it's, it's up there. And when it doesn't just work, that's when platform lock-in wins, paid hosting for basic content wins, big publishing wins, closed source wins, giant electrical usage wins. The number of past websites that I have that are powered by databases endlessly scattered out there that I can't even remember exist, but I stumble on in my own searches for content sometimes is ridiculous. I've moved from WordPress to Drupal to Drupal to Grav to Dev.2 to Medium, all these different sources, none of which talk to each other that I had to relearn every single time. And I do this stuff. I didn't want to mess with the web technology for that reason. And so the invisible UX wins. When it took one click, I'm in with GitHub, that won. So in our world, I want you to be able to import hack sites from anything. You should be able to do that by pointing to a URL in most instances. If it's a publicly available URL, and we're gonna get into some interesting Creative Commons discussions at some point, I should be able to take and fork that without knowing what fork means. I should be able to edit hacks using a myriad of sources. We have a I learned broken in PHP 8 backend. Thank you very much. Um, uh, PHP 7 compatible uh, version, a uh, Node.js based version, an Electron app. We can also edit hacks using 11 and we have some older versions of Drupal that support it. I need to upgrade all my other integrations. I actually have like eight other CMSs on there. And then it's where we deploy it, right? So static or dynamic, it shouldn't matter. These decision tree things should not matter. What your preference is, it should be able to get out on the web. And so too long didn't read, hacks edits and saves HTML via the web component standard. It looks for hacks schema supplied by the tag. So it works with or without the hacks editor being there. The page content is stored as HTML files. We have a database, if you will, called site.json, which is just a JSON blob that manages the page relationships. And the theme layer is a web component. And you should be able to download things as a zip or import via URL. But really, you have to play with it or see it to actually see what I'm describing when it comes to ubiquity. So let's make the web ubiquitous. Now, if you have a laptop, your easiest way to play would be go to hax.psu.edu. If you don't and you're on your phone and you just want to browse around, see what this looks like on mobile, shred me because it doesn't look a certain way or whatever, um, you're going to want to go to this site and hit Learn Hacks. For Penn State University members, which I realize no one here is, they click this button and it brokers an institutional login and they get a copy of Hacks. So that is how we've been able to, at this point, spread it, spread the love to, what are we at? Live count, 226 sites, 178 users, 9,000 plus pages of content. So scrolling through that site or going through the docs, you can see there's many examples. Some of it is you kind of have to see stuff people have made with hacks. All right, so this is one of our uh, sites that we're gonna be promoting in the very near future. Um, this is uh, the Launch Box, which is an innovation network at Penn State. It's an outreach campaign. And they turned to hacks because it was easy for them to just dump a bunch of content in, make quick modifications, meet university branding, and have a static website. So there's lots of different sites using hacks. Uh, here's a whole bunch of OER courses. Um, go to physics, sure. There's, I swear it's there. I had this issue yesterday as well. Um, I can't prevent someone from uploading a large banner image, but so simple content in this case, right? Just a basic outline. The components in the page are web components. So if I right click and inspect anything, we can see 
That is not just some style, interestingly styled piece of the page. That is a stop note. A stop note has been engineered in a very specific way to communicate directions to students in this case. So if we wanted to make a stop note or see how faculty have done that, I can go back to hacks. And if you're on that site and you have a laptop, uh, I believe the command, let me pull the command up there real quick before I go on my thing here. You can run npm init at hacks the web, and this infrastructure architecture will set up locally for you. Um, that is our CLI tool. There's also uh, an npx command, uh, which is available through that, which will just run the, the web server part. But so, Immediately, and we get this a lot internally, is why does this look like a video game? Um, and so the system looks like a video game because it was a student design project. They were tasked with making web fun. And so I need to make a new website, and it's called Fossey Fun. It should feel like a video game, and it does. And this hat should probably look familiar. My students made it the loading bar, and that was not actually required the project. And so I have a website. If I need to edit, the bar is pervasive at the top. Let's say you need basic text operations, right? People expect things like this, and I should be able to do bullet it, bullets, whatever, right? There's nothing special there. Where it gets special is when we get into adding additional blocks. So if I'm an instructor and I need to make that stop note or I add a learning component to the page, I upset things because it's a live demo. Hold on. I don't like this theme. I changed the theme. Let's go to clean two. All right. Let's try to edit that page in clean two. There we go. I apparently brought back whatever it was that I just messed up in that theme. So we have component-based architecture, right? And so as I'm typing over here, it's editing on this side. But what our users are doing, no matter which what they're writing in the page, right? this is a learning hyphen component. So we're building an interface for them where if you're familiar with Gutenberg, this will be a React-based ecosystem. I have these blocks that then have to talk to the back end and then the interpretation and it's injected in the page. And you can do some awesome UX patterns with that, but your content is permanently locked into that structure with the database in mind. It's harder to update, although it's gotten better for sure on that front. But the blocks and things that we put into here, whether it's for a QR code, all right, if I wanted to give you a link to etopro.com, Right, I can give someone the ability to make a QR code. We could take that content, and I can copy it, and I could go to a code pen that has the magic script, which hydrates tags as it finds them undefined, paste it in, and get the same result. So the content is liberated of the platform. These tags work on any site, and then hacks and inter interrogates the tag on user selection and builds the form. Then when we modify the fields, we're modifying the attributes in the HTML. So here you can see it says red if I turn that blue, right? Obviously I have to know what the API is. Oh, I have type assessment, that's a poor example, sorry. So we've been building other sites out of this. I build my own blog out of this. But when I go to edit my blog, I tend to work on my computer here. And so the way I do that is fire up our npx command. Right, and then I'm able to edit my blog post about Fossey day three, add some additional detail, or maybe add a video to the page, change that video to be something really awesome that I saw another contributor talking about, which was what is open source.
All right, save. And then when I want to go to publish that, everything that I'm doing, in this case, is in a Git repo. We've already primed our Git repos so that they're wired up to uh, Vercel, GitHub pages, and Netlify very easily because I don't want to configure that stuff, even though I know how to do that. So we're trying to reduce that grind no matter how you're getting material from point A to point B. If I were to go back here, we'll run NPX again. So I don't have as many sites here, but if I wanted to import a site, I should be able to, for example, go from this Word doc file that I have here. Because if I don't know what the web is, opening this document on my computer, typing headings and text is way easier. And so if we can take that and we can turn it into HTML structure, we can turn it into a hack site. So this is that same content on, from that file pulled in, it generated the pages, which we can then modify the title and do whatever we want at this point. Everything I have in here, day three now, everything I have in here at any point in time, I could take and I can download. And obviously you have to have the sound effects on and, and you can turn them off. Um, and this is all the files that that just wrote. The content of the pages is kept here as individual pieces. So awaiting more awesome stuff tomorrow, it's just the content of that page. Now this does mean that we hydrate things on the fly. So there can be some performance trade-offs as a result of that, but we're trying to get people on the web as quickly as possible in a format that we can sustain without knowing what they built no matter where they are. And so as a result, I am the sole developer on most of those 500 bricks over the last few years. This has completely replaced my job. People go and they just author web content without having to talk to me. If I need to get involved because there's an accessibility issue, I look and see the tag that we just got dinged on accessibility because I make mistakes. That's traceable to a single file. I can update that file and push it out. If I need to fix it in isolation, it's in isolation by design. And so we're, we're really pushing towards making new themes throughout the next year, seeing where we can take this platform um, because design and documentation is certainly everything. But if you want to learn more about the project or how to get involved, all right, here's a list of links. We're always looking for people to just try it out and break stuff, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> so we have PHP based versions. I highlighting the node based ones because it's real easy and magic to type NPX and then magically you're building websites. Um, but I think at this point, if you have any questions, oh, we got 15 minutes left. Oh, geez. I got a ton of time. I can show a whole bunch of stuff. Jeez. All right. Sorry. Yes. Uh, when you, if, I, if you have it in the editor of the browser, not globally, okay. you can say what happened. So, good question. In the case of, so in the case of when I'm, this is the, <laughs> and there's my post, cool. So, this is built on GitHub pages. It's static. And so, what's happening is if I have a validated JSON web token, as part of the bootstrap process of the static assets, it sees that, it tests it, and then goes, oh, you can edit this. And that jogs in. So that editing experience doesn't show up. It, it's validated on that JSON web token. But obviously, because I this is a statically delivered site, I can't go and just edit the page. If anyone wants to keep the editing, then they have to be running it locally. Do the editing, and then have some separate publisher or use the Electron app. So we're trying to get this to be distributed such that, are you seriously not gonna open for me? Like when I, when I say, oh, I see, cause I already have it and running. Um, but the idea is yes, that you could publish it at any point in time. Now it is static. It's like, it's a copy of that at that point in time. The, the other site that I went to, 
or when I go to Hacks PSU, because none of you can click start, but when I click start, this is a deployed copy of that system. And so in this case, because I'm logged in, I can go to Fossey Fun and I can get the editor and it's doing the saving and writing to those files on the server. So when you look at the server? Yes. Because it's live, yes. And so this is this we use this deployment for kind of two purposes. Um, one is for you know, like, hey, I'm working on my course. I do some edits or whatever. But then when we give out addresses to people, um, this is a specialized version of HackCMS called ha Haxium, and so it's just a wrapper on top of it that needs to be rewritten in Docker for sure. But when we give out links to people, we give them this address. And if, if someone sends out the editing address, it notices that you don't have a JSON web token and kicks you over anyway. So this is our solution as far as, I just want to edit the thing and it's there. That's kind of what we're going for, yes, is that anyone should be able to author that stuff. But unlike Wixland, I should be able to take, take that site. Let's see, I didn't show that. I, for some reason, thought it was only 30 minutes. So I'm glad I read. Thank you for the 15 minute notice. Right? So I want to be able to fork that or move from some other prior source. I can point to that site. And because the site is that imported awkwardly fast, I hope it actually worked. Oh, there we go. All right. At least I'll say it has to think a little bit. So this is my IST 402 course, all the material, the same structure, but now it's on my computer. So I've effectively forked that course. And we're able to do this via, um, we have a, a wonderful fleet of open microservices running on Vercel. And so, and for Node.js version, I could just pull those down local to the application. But so what happens is on any import or any building of a new site, it effectively, if I could type the word JSON there, man, it effectively just takes this structure. And when you add a new page, it generates a new item in our schema. So that's the relationship between the pages. Then our themes just take that data and using MobX, iterate through based on the unique ID. So all of our bricks in our, our theme layer are reactive to the MobX store when it comes to what is the active ID right now. So we're able to build radically different, at times stupid, terrible designs um, I do, I did say that on purpose because there is literally a category under here called terrible. And if you want a terrible production site, there we go. So now it's terrible. This is a terrible table-based design, but I usually use the terrible sites. These are the sites I made in college, by the way, that's why they're terrible. So I use the terrible design just to try and illustrate, right? I'm editing web content here. I've got support for my video tag and all that fun stuff. And I hit save, which is updating that underlying static HTML. And then I hate this terrible theme and I want to move it over to my very formalized resume theme, which honestly didn't look too different from the rest of them. Wow, it was bad web design that was table based back in uh, 2002. Right? That content is free from, from the theme layer. So, yes, I could have Wix in a box. I could take this. I could fire up the Electron app. Please load this time. Oh no, I'm still running it locally. It uses the same port. And so I keep like ticking it off as it goes to do the import. So eventually it will load. Any other questions while I wait for that to time out again? <laughs> so I can run the Electron app. <laughs> yes. Um, so it has a node and a PHP based backend. Um, I've been for what purpose? I mean, for like server side rendering. Yeah. 
with um that's a good question yeah that's currently that sort of setup is is out of scope so we do have all the bricks that are sitting there on the front end for like our login system are only loosely tied to hacks they tend to not be it tends to be via event driven messages and so there's probably a mess i'm saying probably because i don't remember the apis of all 500 and some off the top of my head but you put in the login form you hit submit an event is listened for I take that, I broker it over to a back end and then go, hey, hey, here you are, you can log in. So we try as much as possible to keep these bricks abstract so that we can repurpose them over and over again. Um, an example of where that was uh, visually taking place and I, I didn't actually point it out, the cards on this site, the icons, the, the design is, this is a static site. This isn't actually hacks but it's using all the same components and it's just throwing them into a more traditional build and bundle routine. So um, we also have, uh, oh, I, I finally got the Electron app working, right? So the Electron app, I could fire that up. And at that point, I don't have someone need to know this is a website, right? I could give them a file and say, hey, open this app and edit it because we want to eliminate the web publishing aspect or create an interesting workflow at, at the minimum. We also have a CLI which that was at least where my head went when you said, um, when you said non-visual sides. And so if I open up the CLI, I could start building hack sites that way. We also have a project called Hacks Levendy, which mixes the Levendy into this We're really trying, I mean, I'm totally open to uh, exploring what you, what you said. We're trying to support any backend that there is because we want this to just be, hey, these things just plug into stuff. The Drupal, WordPress, Classic Press, Grav CMS. I forget what the other one is. Uh, modules, because uh, I have those in those different ecosystems, basically just hijack the HTML blob area. They're not the full content management system. Any question? There's another question. Merlin. So Merlin is our fun little. Um, persona for finding help and editing things. So let me close a bunch of these out. Uh, Merlin, in this case, is on our command line and says, hey, do you want to build a new site or do you want to just build components? So it's kind of just an embodiment of, sure, launch a new site. It's our fun CLI, there we go. But on the front end, Merlin is uh, kind of an omnibar. So when you hit Merlin, it activates this. And so we want to try to eliminate that cruft of what do I do or how can I do something? And so if I know what it is, like uh, I had a bug, right? Even if it's shortcutting from where you were and what you were using directly into our issue queue, I want to be able to point people to Merlin as the constant way of being able to engage with the ecosystem. So if we have feature requests, people go to Merlin. If you if I forget how to edit the site, oh, there it is. It can suggest the commands a la Alfred app, if you've used Alfred before in OS X or Spotlight Context. While I'm in this context currently, Merlin can be used in context as it says type slash. And so we get slash commands. You can do the same things Merlin's brought into context here. So if I forget that I can write headings, I type the word header and I get one. If I want to put a table in context, I can put a table in there, have a really robust table experience. All right, let it save. And then the output of that table in that case is just HTML. So Merlin is trying to be sort of our uh, AI assistant, do everything little guy. There's also the ability to run slash commands and dig into an in visual embodiment of Merlin that we're going to start uh, piloting this spring where we have it hooked up to an LLM that's analyzing just the course itself. And so well, we use this a lot for courses, used for blogs, but I usually use the word course there. So, so that students could use Merlin as a digital assistant and he could sidecar any hack site in this case. Now, when we get to that point, we're getting into infrastructure costs and like, I have no idea how that's gonna pan out <laughs> as far as costs or how we'll pay for those things. So we're tiptoeing our way there for sure. Um, but Merlin is sort of our, our omnibar uh, agent thing. How may I help you? 
search YouTube. Search YouTube. No, I typed it. It's under suggesting SEO settings. I don't have YouTube hooked up to this thing. But sorry, that's what Merlin is. So it's, we're kind of any, any new block that gets added, you can type the name of it there. We want to start to get into having that actually search our doc site because our doc site is built using hacks which is all available under Learn Hacks. Um, you can learn about the community, the pillars of our community, as far as why it's built the way it is or what we're seeking to achieve. But any, any other questions? We've got two, uh, three minutes, I think. Yeah? Yes, so there's, um, wait for that look. So this is actually a hack CMS site with a completely custom theme and information architecture and structure. So they basically went and used the fact that we have the editor and it can support tagging. And they went and then used that capability to build a theme completely around that information architecture. We've kept from doing that as long as possible, but like that's the next natural evolution of what we're doing. Um, there's also, uh, that's one of the reasons people in the past have used Hacks Levendy, which is a mashup of Levendy and Hacks, which is somewhere on here. We have an example, um, not physics. There it is, the Sea Voyage. So university libraries use this to build um, custom components to put in. And so that flashes really quickly, but what this is doing is playing a ancient XML format. There we go. Um, so it's, playing a, a historical play that they've turned into this like play reading XML format. And so there's a web component that they made custom to rope in there. There we go, you see TEI types of tags in there, which are not our normal tags. So yes, we're trying, we're trying to work on the documentation as far as how do we provide the best developer experience to do that? Like I wanna open the CLI, I want it to realize it's in the context of a site and suggest like a la Drush, if you're, if you're familiar with the Drupal universe, like here's the things you can do. Here's the commands I can run. I want to start a new theme. It should just know where to put the, the code for that. So the vast majority of the, of the tags are already pre-compiled. We compile them in place. Um, that becomes a little tricky. Like how do you resolve wanting to do modern front end web development in a really nice um, structured way? Like I would have to make those individual tags and do it sort of sidecar to this ecosystem. So we do have ways of doing that. The, the custom customer discovery people did very subtle, you can't even tell, honestly. Uh, they did like subtle CSS tweaks as far as certain spacing and things that they really wanted. And so, yeah, there's some, there's some sidecar there. There's a ton of CSS variables. Um, these are all powered by shadow roots, but we leave parts behind, which is a spec so that you can pierce shadow roots and correctly style things for those little nudging to the goal line but yeah one last one um you do have to accommodate for it but it they do handle them pretty well, yeah. So, I mean, I st the same rules still apply in a shadow route. I need to make sure I've got area text correctly. I'm not just making clickable divs and silliness like that. Um, so they, I, we haven't had any issue handling them. If anything, and this became controversial internally, I said this eliminates a lot of accessibility issues only because of the accountability. I'm not building a whole bunch of gobbledygook that's smashed together and then, oh shoot, we didn't account for this block here, which is a pile of divs. So it added that accountability on our side. Um, for example, we had an accessibility issue in the editor's labeling system. I, it was like an oversight. I used title instead of area label and it wasn't technically correct. That became fixing it 42 times by fixing it in one place. And so when we pushed the fix out like 30 minutes later, our disability services office was like, how did you just do that? <laughs> so yes, it's, we, we take that very seriously. A large part of this is also, 
if you have these settings and you and a user just wants to make something red, they're not saying, wow, I want people to not be able to engage with this. And so when they set things to red, we want to be able to do auto color contrasting, have a design system all wrapped around that. So great question. And I think that's it. Yeah. Thank you, Brian.